It occurred to me that while I've been living in my house for about six months now, and I've even built a couple of new servers, I really haven't shown you how I set up my home network. Well, let's do that. Let's see here, we got Irish Red, Stout, IPA. There it is. It's a Fractal Design Celsius Plus S24 Prisma. All right. However you're trying to stay cool, make the right choice with the all-new Fractal Design Celsius Plus line of all-in-one liquid coolers. Available in 240, 280, and 360 millimeter sizes, along with your choice of dynamic or Prisma RGB fans, you'll be sure to find the right cooler for your system. Click the link down in the video description to learn more. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. Like I said, when I moved into my house about six months ago, I set up my home network rather quickly, mainly because the six months prior to that, I hadn't really been making videos on a regular basis. And so getting back up and running was priority number one. Priority number two was, well, unpacking the rest of the house. And I think we finally finished that one up last weekend. So I can finally show you what I've built in here. So let me go ahead and grab the camera and you can come along for the ride. First and foremost, we'll go ahead and start on the other side of the room that I see while I'm filming and is usually behind the camera. This is my editing desk, and it's actually the desk that followed me from my previous house using a couple of IKEA countertops and uh, some very, very inexpensive legs down there. But while the desk looks pretty good and is very functional, that's not what we're focusing on today. In fact, below my editing PC here is a lot of the brains of my operation. I think we'll start here with the uh, shameful position of the modem and router in my setup as they are both laying on the floor. Uh, my cable modem is an RS-SB8200. It is a 1.7 gigabit capable modem, as well as the uh, Unify USG sitting down there on the ground. Uh, that's pretty much the brains of the whole operation and uh, how I get online. And if we follow those cables up from there, we will see the rest of my studio network mounted up underneath the desk. That is a Microtik CSS326 Cloud Smart Switch. However, I don't use any of the smart functionality on that. It basically sits under there as a dumb switch, simply providing connectivity to all the rest of the devices. As you can see, most of this switch is pretty underutilized, but it does have a special feature over here on the right, and that it does have two 10 gigabit SFP Plus ports, meaning I can hook up my desktop and then run a 10 gig line out to the server rack in my garage. The best part about the CSS 326 is the price. It was only about $140, meaning if you only have two 10 gigabit devices and you only wanna use one device to hook up most of your network, this is pretty much your best option. One of those 10 gigabit ports does go up to my editing PC right here. And just as a reminder, this is running a Threadripper 2950X 16 core CPU along with an RTX 2080 graphics card and handles pretty much all of the editing that you see on the channel. The other 10 gig port runs up a fiber line into this nice little wall port right here. That feeds the server rack out in my garage and that's where we're gonna head to next. And here we are on the garage side of things. And you've actually seen the server rack in my garage before. In fact, it was in a couple of B-roll shots in part three of my cloud gaming server rig, but I wasn't quite ready to go through a full walkthrough of what was running in here. In fact, I'm still not quite ready to fully show it off as I still have a couple temporary cable runs going on, but we'll address all of the features that are in this right now, as well as some of the upgrades and changes that I wanna make in the very near future. So right up there on the wall, you can see the other end of that fiber cable coming in and it goes down to my my top of the rack switch, which is right here. Now this is kind of the big brother to the CSS 326 that is in my studio. This is the CRS 32824P4SRM. It is kind of the same design where it's a 24 port gigabit switch, but it does have four 10 gigabit SFP plus ports as opposed to the just two. However, this one also has the distinct advantage of having power over ethernet plus on every single one of the 24 ports right here in the switch, which means it's fully able to power all of the Wi-Fi and hopefully some home automation and security cameras in the future. Now I'm sure most of you already noticed the uh, cable running up into the attic space of my house. That's actually powering the Unify Nano HD access point sitting up in my stairwell, providing most of the Wi-Fi to my house. I do have another Unify Pro sitting right down here that is gonna be permanently mounted in the garage, hopefully sooner rather than later. And I have a third access point ready to go downstairs for 100% coverage. But for right now, this setup does work pretty darn well. Just above the network switch is something that I've wanted to permanently install in my rack for quite some time, and that is my 15-inch network console. This is a keyboard mouse monitor all in a single 1U package. Now, it is quite an older unit with only a 15-inch screen with a 1024 by 768 resolution and just a PS2-based keyboard and mouse. 
And while it does get the job done just fine, it does have one major drawback in that it is only a single PC connection. Meaning if I wanted to change the computer that this is hooked up to, I need to actually physically reach back and unplug and replug it into the next computer down the line. We're gonna fix that with this box right here. Now I've been waiting for this to arrive for almost two weeks now, so I am pretty excited to finally get this installed. This is an eight port rack mounted KVM switch. And again, it's a little bit older unit, but the price was right at just $87. It is an eight port VGA switch with USB for connectivity to your keyboard and mouse. However, I already have a PS2 to USB adapter, so plugging in the keyboard and mouse off my console should be no problem at all. Let's go ahead and get this installed and then we'll continue on with the rest of the tour. Now that it's screwed into the rack, let's go ahead and uh, get this thing wired up and go through a couple of features here. Now, when you first saw me screw this into the rack, you saw me put it on top of my monitor console. Two main problems with that. Number one, I can't see which device I'm actually connecting to. And number two, I can't use the USB pass-through feature that is in this KVM switch, which is one of the main reasons I picked it. That is, I can plug something like a USB key in and plug it into any server that I'm currently working on. Now, problem number one is alleviated by this little remote control here. This allows me to choose whichever computer I want without having to see the console directly. However, problem number two, I still can't plug a USB key into the front of this, so I went ahead and moved it right below the network switch in the rack. One of the really nice things about this KVM switch is for $87, it includes the switch itself and includes all of the cables that you need. So it includes eight of these console cables. There's a VGA plug on one side, and the other side has another VGA plug, but with a USB header. This end goes into the server you want to control this one goes into the KVM switch and passes the USB and VGA through the single cable. The other cool thing is this is actually USB bus powered. So as long as you have this plugged into one powered on server, your KVM switch will have power. It doesn't require any external power bricks. And just like that, we have a working KVM switch. Now, full disclosure, this isn't the first time that I've used this particular KVM switch, but it is the first time that I've purchased one for myself. And I've got to tell you, it works great. Now, it is pretty basic in its features. It is only VGA. It is only USB 2.0. It doesn't support a lot of the, you know, new flashy features. It's not remote accessible over IP. But at the same time, it absolutely gets the job done for a home network. And at $87 for a rack mount unit, it's very, very affordable. But now that that is up and running, let's go ahead and walk through the rest of the servers that are actually in my rack right now and find out what I'm doing with them right now and what the future plans are for everything in here. Starting with the server that should need no introduction. This is my Dell R7610, and it is probably the server that has been featured most on my channel. The server has, however, undergone just a couple of changes, some of which I'm willing to talk about right now. Others, you're gonna have to make sure you're subscribed to Craft Computing so you don't miss any future videos. But in short, I did cut the server down from its existing 192 gigabytes of memory down to 128 gigs, mainly because I just don't think I'm gonna be utilizing quite that much. It is, however, still running the pair of E5 2670 V2 10-core CPUs for a total of 20 cores and 40 threads. Now, this is the server that I ran all of my Tesla K10 and Grid K2 tests on, and while that project was pretty much dead in the water, I am gonna give this Grid K2 card one last gasp. However, I am also going to give a test to this brand new card that I just picked up. This is a Grid M40, and unlike the Grid K2, it has four NVIDIA GPUs on board and a total of 16 gigabytes of memory. So I'm not quite ready to give up on Grid vGPU support just yet. So uh, again, make sure you're subscribed. Now, as the server has only been ran for testing purposes over the last six months or so, it is uh, pretty much spotless inside and out. So I'm not gonna have to do any maintenance on this server right now. However, the other two servers in my rack, I am going to open up and clean out, dust out. And uh, in one of them, I am gonna add some new hardware. So let's go ahead and get down into that one right now. 
Next up, besides being slightly awkward to film, seeing as it's uh, around the height of my knees, is my Proxmox virtualization server. Now, I had two main goals in mind when I built the server about a year and a half ago. First and foremost, I wanted it to be very energy efficient, and number two, I wanted it to still have a good amount of multi-threaded horsepower. And I think uh, both goals were very easily achieved. As a reminder, this is running a Gigabyte server motherboard with dual E5 2658 core Xeon CPUs for a total horsepower of 16 cores and 32 threads. Now, the base clock is only 2 gigahertz, but they do boost up to 2.5 if the need arises. But overall, I don't have a lot of high horsepower needs out of this server. Mainly, I just have a lot of different VMs that I run at the same time. And as far as energy efficiency goes, each of these CPUs is only 65 watts for a total of 130 watts of total draw at full tilt. Now, the server never runs at full tilt, meaning even if I max the server out, it's only going to draw about 150 to 170 watts of total power. And for the use that I get out of this thing, that's pretty crazy. For today, we're going to take this thing out of the rack. We're going to vacuum out the front of it just to uh, get the dust bunnies taken care of. And then I do have a brand new 10 gigabit network card that I am going to throw in here and hopefully get that up and running. And finally, last but not least, all the way at the bottom of my server rack here, well, that one. We'll talk about this one in a bit. This one right here. Uh, that is my FreeNAS box, and it is definitely the red-headed stepchild of my rack. Not that it's not a fully capable server, but it's the only one not running server hardware. In fact, not only is it only running consumer hardware, it's also running pretty low-end consumer hardware. Now, it is newer stuff. It's a Z370 motherboard with an i3-8100 4-core, four 4-threaded four CPU, and 32 gigabytes of 2133 megahertz memory. Uh, so it's definitely not a powerhouse, but it has been running just fine for me. As far as the storage array goes, that is where I'm running some enterprise hardware in this box. It's got an LSI 9201-8i host bus adapter, as well as six 6 terabyte HGST Helium Enterprise SAS drives. I do have two 120 gig SSDs set up in a ZFS mirrored configuration for my boot disk, and my HGST drives are set up in a RAID Z2 configuration, which is the equivalent to a RAID 6, giving me a two drive failover point. Now the free NAS box, I'm not going to pull out of the server rack just yet. I'm just gonna vacuum out the filter on the front of it. But this brings me to the next point of what comes next for my home server rack. First and foremost, I'm gonna play a little bit of musical chairs when it comes to which server actually performs what role, starting with my Dell R7610. This is going to become my new primary Proxmox server, running essentially all of the mission critical VMs that I have in my server rack. Once I've transferred all of those VMs from my old Proxmox server to the Dell R7610, my dual gigabyte motherboard is likely going to become my new FreeNAS server. And that is where, uh, well, that guy comes into play. I'm going to be running that gigabyte dual CPU board inside this all new 24 bay server and doing a full new round of FreeNAS tutorials. Hold up, scratch that, true NAS core tutorials. On top of the CPU increase from the, well, 4-core and 4-thread that it's currently running on to the 16-core and 32-thread that's available in this server right here, we're also going to be jumping up from 32 gigs of non-ECC memory to 128 gigs of ECC registered DDR3. So uh, that's going to be a massive stability increase. Although, I'll remind you, it's been running just fine with the 32 gigs as is. Now, obviously, I'm also aiming for a massive capacity increase with this new server build, moving from the 20 terabytes currently available in my FreeNAS server to well, whatever a 24 base server will hold these days. But I'm not going to be going with 100% spinning disks. I do want to play around with the new mixed VDEV availability inside TrueNAS Core, that is mixing spinning disks and SSDs in the same array. So if you are a home server storage, or even a small and medium business server storage junkie, make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss the all new rounds of tutorials coming very soon to the channel. And there you have it. That's how my home network has evolved since pretty much the day I moved into this house. As you can see, there's already been quite a bit of work done, but it's still got quite a ways to go to get it to exactly where I want it to be. 
If you've been waiting for more server and networking content to drop, well, now is the time that it's gonna happen. As you can see, I've got quite a few brand new projects that are lined up and ready to go over the next couple of months. And as much ideas as I have, if you have any ideas for tutorials or content that you'd like to see, make sure to leave me a comment down below. I'm always looking for new ideas that you guys find interesting. Just in the next couple of months, we've got all of the server transitions that I mentioned earlier, plus my all new TrueNAS core build and installation tutorial series. We've got this really sweet QNAP switch and server combo that I'm gonna be reviewing and coming up with a couple projects here for in the next couple of weeks, plus any ideas that you guys would like to throw out there. If you guys like this video and you wanna see more like it, make sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. And follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with my daily shenanigans. If you like the content you see on this channel, and you'd like to help support what I do, make sure to visit the Patreon down in the video description. You'll get exclusive access to my Discord server, where you can chat with myself and the other hosts from Talking Heads, my once weekly live show, and you'll quite literally be helping me keep the lights on around here. Thank you guys so much for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys.